I'm ready. Okay, so George, you have 20 minutes to present your work, and then we will continue with 10 minutes of question and exchange on this subject. Uh, please don't go to too close to the screen because it disturbs the captation. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks you to um, Laval Virtual for organizing this stimulating online conference. I'm going uh, to introduce the implementation of a concept bringing together the immemorial power of shadows to make us live incredible stories and the emergent fascinating expressive potentialities of VR. I will first speak about the place of shadows in arts and sciences and their specific importance in digital art. Then I will shortly explore the concept of virtual theater. After I will introduce the virtual shadow theater setup and the nature of the digital shadow avatars. I will discuss issues raised by directing this living shadow avatar and conclude with two use cases, a performance and a pedagogical masterclasses. Shadows that materialize the presence of an object or a body in a stream of light by the absence of light impact on the surrounding space have always fascinated human beings. In his book, Natural History, Pliny explained how the clay modeler Butades discovered the art of painting by seeing his daughter drawing the outlines of her lover's head shadow. In the allegory of the cave, in his work Republic, Plato used them to illustrate how imperfect is our perception of the real world. More widely, shadows inspired a great variety of myths and tales amid all the peoples and gave birth to num numerous pieces of art and literature. The shadow is sometimes considered as a kind of reflection or a double, often with malefic intentions as a doppelganger. In the history of science, shadows have been central in many discoveries, including that of the peripheral place of the Earth in the solar system by Galileo's telescopic observation of the phases of Venus at the beginning of the 17th century. Finally, playing with shadows could be considered as a way to explore the complexity of reality. Their immaterial nature probably helps to make shadow a recurrent topic in numerous digital art pieces or performances. The artwork video plays by Myron Kruger in the 70s can be seen as a landmark. One interesting aspect of digital shadows is that they are often used to create a bridge between the physical and the digital realities, either for the spectator or the performer. One's own digital shadow allows people to interact with, with virtual entities. With this artistic installation, Kruger built the first virtual theater with digital silhouettes shadows, allowing the onlooker to interact with an intelligent artificial environment. Indeed, Kruger imagined a possible future for theater with the concept of distributed theater in which actors could play in separate physical space and meet inside a video space similar as video plays. But this distributed theater lost the key theatrical issue of having spectators and actors sharing a common space and living a common experience. We let aside in this communication the complex question of the connection between audience and stage, and we focus on the stage itself and the hybrid relationships between physical and digital realities, including both the set and the actors. Considering that, that a virtual theater is also a part of the real world, it has to manage the coexistence of 3D scenography and physical set and it has to make possible for actors to inhabit the real time, to inhabit in real time the 3D scenography for the pleasure of an audience. The basic feature of theater is to make characters alive and playing interesting plots. To achieve it, actors should be able to act through virtual entities in VR and to keep a close connection with physical partners and of course the audience. We won't consider here immersed experience. They are still very new in performing arts. Anyway, this Laval Virtual Online Conference demonstrates that immersed solutions become more and more accessible. But as to the theater, 
it will be for a next step. Inhabiting an avatar in real time on stage is a challenge for an actor. Trickster at the intersection by Vu and colleagues introduced a promising real time performance system for virtual theater. And the progress of low cost motion capture devices in the last decade, such as the Microsoft Kinect camera or inertial motion capture suits, have made possible the exploration of VR for theater. Recently, the Royal Shakespeare Company, in collaboration with Intel and Andy Serkis Imaginarium Studio, released an astounding version of the famous Tempest by Shakespeare. An actor equipped with X-Sense mocap suit played both physically and virtually aerial character, who never stops doing magical and terrifying tricks on stage. For the occasion, the set was mapped by about 30 video projectors and controlled by an army of digital artists and technicians. Our setup is more modest, but not less ambitious. We get inspired by traditional shadow theater. In this expression, the word theater has two meanings. The first is a style of living art using shadows, which is different in nature from the performing art with physical actors. It requires either immaterial silhouettes or manipulated objects. The second meaning is a specific architecture necessary to present shadows to the audience. Traditional structure is often small and elevated. In French, the small theatrical structure that could remind of a large model is named castellet. The idea of the virtual castellet is to simulate both the living art style of playing with shadows and the physical structure with its light and set requirements. Cavewave is the French acronym for the Castellet Virtuel d'Ombre Avatar concept that we adapt in English as Castellet in VR for Shadow Avatar. We are keeping a frame around the virtual 3D image as to represent a virtual opening inside the, the physical stage that could be seen as a window giving to another theatrical world. We use, in fact, the meta theater situation of plays within plays. The size of the frame is, of course, flexible. On the left image, you can see an intimate setup with a small audience close to the traditional shadow play setup. The physical actor sit on the left interacts with avatars in the virtual theater. On the right, we have a larger image with a scale ratio quasi one to one for the avatars. For the audience, the global stage mixes two different levels of reality that seem following equivalent rules. A noticeable feature for Cavewave is that it makes easily possible to play firstly only with shadows, secondly with shadows and 3D virtual puppets, thirdly only with 3D puppets. These combinations are of course not accessible in traditional theater. This mixed reality setup has two principal aims. First, eliciting theatrical interactions between physical and digital realities based on situations that duplicate the body confronted to its shadow. Secondly, enriching the art of directing actors, shadows and puppets by mixing different acting approaches. The shadow avatar that we call OAV is for the moment the main character in Kevlar's setup. It is inspired by Peter Schlemiel's miraculous story, wrote by Chamisot in 1814, in which a man in grey exchanges Peter Schlemiel's shadow with the magic bottomless gold sack that makes fortune to his owner. To proceed, the devil peels from the floor the shadow cast by the sunlight. An OAV is a sort of flat shadow able to move in 3D. In a video game engine, it is built by rigging any human flat silhouette by controlling it with a motion uh, capture device. And it is always surprising when we simulate the shadow transition from 2D to 3D. It is one example of interactions between different levels of reality intricated on the mixed stage. On the right image, it seems that OEVs are backstage behind a translucent screen and are lit with a rear projector that produces the traditional result that we see in shadow theater. But for rendering reasons, instead of being produced by a real light, 
it is made with an OAV in front of the screen, invisible and casting a shadow. Numerous other graphic combinations can be explored in the setup with the shadow avatar. We use here the same we use here same effect of being invisible and casting a shadow, and we put the two OAVs on the same location. It is as if the shadow of the 3D silhouette becomes independent and does not obey its master. We have also the situation of an OAV without shadow, as the poor Peter Schlemil, admiring what it lost at the foot of an another OAV. How is it working? We use avatar staging global framework that we introduced in this conference two years ago. In avatar staging, a performer wearing a motion capture suit that we call mocaptor acts in space C and controls an avatar in virtual space B, interacting with a physical performer in space A in front of B. A and B form the mixed reality stage in front of the audience E. Partner using hand devices as gamepad or MIDI controller that we call manipulator helps the mocaptor control his avatar in the mixed reality stage. As we explained, Kevoave setup specifies the nature of both the set design and the avatars in this way. First, virtual space B represents a surgical stage behind a frame. Secondly, Avatars are flat human silhouette shadows with two types of behavior. These two types relate to two different approaches for directing OAVs on the virtual set. First approach, it can be done in real time by a mock actor acting in front of the screen or hidden behind the scenes. This approach requires a close collaboration between the mock actor and the manipulator actor to achieve the presence effect. This presence effect is the audience's acceptance that the virtual bodies share the same space and time as the human actors. Indeed, working in a mixed reality setup that opposes physical actors and virtual characters is especially challenging in terms of this presence effect. This is a condition for achieving suspension of disbelief as to the nature of the virtual characters displayed on stage. We will focus here on the second approach that consists in recording animations and playing them afterwards during a performance with a specific tool that respects the presence effect condition. Combined with an inertial motion capture suit, easily usable on a theater stage, our pipeline enables to record numerous takes in onset pre-visualization pre condition that is that we check in real time the final result in the shadow theater scenography. The motion capture session needs to be performed in the right place to obtain the best avatar movement quality. On the image, you see, for instance, a physical mocaptor recording animations on the final performance setup while using feedback monitors in order to make immediate adjustment based on the virtual rendering. The purpose is to guarantee the best conditions for the mocaptors to inhabit the OAVs and respond to the director's intentions. This pipeline is currently using Noitan's neuron motion capture suit and Axis neuron software to process the data. The motion retargeting from the Axis neuron data to the OAV virtual character is done with Autodesk Motion Builder and the Noitan's motion robot plugin. The retargeting data are sent to Epic's game Unreal Engine 4 through the LiveLink plugin released in 2018 by Epping Game to facilitate onset previsualization with third party softwares. However, the presence effect by itself is not a sufficient criterion. It's also necessary to secure the synchronization between the combined recorded animations and the physical acting when the animations are played during a the performance. Theater imposes to respect the real-time dimension of the acting process to keep its essential nature of living performing art. Looking at performers constrained by the imposed rhythm of a time-fixed movie is unacceptable for the audience. We therefore program a specific virtual puppet that waits for the physical performers. 
is based on a finite state machine mixing two buses, each one combining the same mix of two animation channels. Action channel uses any action starting from an idle pose to another one. Idle channel uses non-looping idle animation. The idle channel is composed of a subsystem that mixes the animation with itself in a reverse mode in order to avoid the looping jump effect, given that an idle animation never ends with the same pose as it starts. This subsystem allows to quickly blend any animation to an idle one in order to suspend our OAV action without having, having to build a jumpless loop animation with a third party software as Motion Builder. It considerably shortens the time to program a complex scenario with numerous OAVs on stage. Finally, the OAV actions are triggered step by step by an operator following living actions done by the performers on the physical stage. It makes possible to build possible interaction between the shadow avatars and the physical performers. We use this pipeline, Kevoave, to produce the following project. The Shadow is a performance after the homonymous Anderson's tale from 1847. I created it in 2019. It tells us the story of a scientist who lost his shadow during a journey abroad. Here is the moment when the scientist sent its shadow to visit a mysterious house, which it never returned from. The shadow became a sort of human, but unfortunately deprived of its own shadow. It came back many years later to make a deal with a scientist in order to get married to a princess. It's a tale. The performer is sitting left aside at a small table. He tells the story and triggers cues with a MIDI controller, step by step, according to the text and his way of acting. Each of the 147 cues of the performance launches till to three animations for each of the five characters. All the animations have been recorded previously in the different sets by the mocaptor and the director. The five characters are played by the same kind of OAV with just changes of the texture, color, and acting style. You see here the princess, the white OAV with the shadow, interacts with the performer seated at the table at, on the left. The shadow, the black OAV without shadow, observes the princess from behind and the scientist, the gray OAV with shadow, waits near the landscape cylinder. Some performances were given to young children from 8 to 12 years old and some impressions were informally collected. Globally, audiences were immersed in the story. Some children were uneven conscious of the real-time process and perceived the animation as a feature film. Others believed that hidden actors were playing off stage, directly reacting to the actor's words. The majority was very intrigued by the OAV's shape and believed it was of paper or aluminum, not aware of motion capture and 3D graphic possibilities. Kevoev gave prom promising results as an artistic tool to captivate audiences. A second use case involves pedagogical masterclasses and workshops intended to introduce theater students or professionals to act and improvise with avatars on a mixed reality stage. There are two acting challenges for the mock actor, inhabiting the virtual body of the, or AV and moving properly in the virtual set making the movement aesthetically interesting according to the reinforced quality of presence given by the status of the virtual body shadow. The combination of avatar embodiment and play with the avatar's own shadow results in an acting constraint that elicits the students to a better understanding of the expressive possibilities of the mixed reality stage virtual part that depends the interaction qualities between physical and digital partners. VR brings a new and unique possibilities of making alive 2D shadows and enlarges the range of surgical situation. We intend to develop the current research by rehearsing more complex interactions between physical performers and shadow avatars 
notably by exploring some bricks of autonomy regarding avatar behavior. We would like also to test Kavoa's setup in an immersive VR context, both for performers and audience. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I may take some questions if there are any. Okay, thank you, George. Uh, any question? Maybe you can write it. Yes, you can upload. Uh, yes, if you have some question, could you write it on the public chat? Or maybe if you raise your hand, I can... Nobody on, on the room? No, no question? No question. No question. So, uh, George, I have one question. Uh, you... you <laughs> Il y a une main qui s'est levée là-bas, mais... Oh, OK. <laughs> Sorry. Ah. Raise your hand. Maybe you can switch on your mic and ask your question. Yes? Uh, can, can you hear my voice? Yes. Yes. Uh, ah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a question about uh, using uh, shadow avatar. Uh, uh, compared to using uh, usual uh, avatar, like virtual YouTuber, what is the most unique point uh, do you think? The most what? unique point of what? Oh, yes. Well, point, uh, like, uh, 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 you, using, uh, I wonder the, uh, what is the uh, most different uh, from uh, uh, when you use a uh, 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 normal avatar, uh, CG model, uh, like a uh, like, uh, virtual YouTuber or uh, but the character, uh, what is the uh, uh, most different? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, in fact, um, ther theoretically, there is no so so big differences between acting uh, with an avatar, uh, no more uh, humanoid avatar, and the kind of avatar I've developed with this flat uh, silhouette. But the question is to ask actors to be aware of the fact that they are they have not a, a normal uh, body and so it asks a special attention to make it expressive uh, move it expressively and also to take in account the fact that they have, they have to play with the with the shadow on the floor and that the relationship between their own uh, physiognomy and the shadow on the floor can have deeper interactions that when you are uh, using a traditional avatar and focusing on this um, uh, titan is this uh, um, close relationships between the body and the uh, reflection of the body on the floor or on the walls helps to uh, make a narrow uh, space of uh, acting it helps uh, actors to focus uh, and to be more expressive and not lost in all the possibilities that a traditional uh, uh, humanoid avatar is given to them. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, Any no. other question? No. The, the, there is another uh, rising hand, uh, I think. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, I just asked to Mylis to prepare the next presentation in order to keep the time yeah. uh, and we can continue the question during the, this time uh, maybe yes Laura, you I see a question no no but i think sip uh, have a, a question yes yeah. marie -Hélène also and hello can you hear uh, and, and marie -Hélène tell me and there is a question in the in the <laughs> can consider that uh, is the constant movement of externalization of human behaviors. The shadow would be one of the first manifestations of this externalization. My question is, um, can you say that the simulation of the shadow, the shadow avatar in virtual reality, is an important movement of this externalization because the shadow avatar become interactive and autonomous? Yes, your question is very interesting. And we can see effectively that um, returning to the origins, in fact, 
uh, could help to explore a um, new uh, way of externalization, the presence on stage. And uh, for the moment, it's a, it's a very emergent project. But of course, it would be very interesting to learn from the past how we can enter in a way of having something outside of your own body and starting to be autonomous, but in connection with your own body, expressing perhaps um, a deeper uh, state of mind, state of an, an unconscious way of, of being on stage and to uh, make an enrich uh, acting for the traditional actor. Thank you very much. I think we have a question of Sip and after we can talk about uh, the, the question of Rav Silva. Uh, Sip, do you okay, have a question? You. Yes. Uh, so my question uh, is regarding the bit of privatization. And uh, my question is, uh, do you think that the performer can also uh, uh, influence uh, that thing? Can also uh, they influence the technical part in order that you don't need to have to operate operating um, uh, perhaps you could speak uh, closer to the mic because it's very difficult to listen to the question. Or, or write the question if you want. Or write it, yes. Okay, I will uh, write. Okay. okay. Maybe you can go to the next question. Maybe yeah. Raf Silva. Raf Silva. Um, yes, I, I, I read the question. Of course, yes. I think that. Uh, being inspired by the tradition is, uh, is something very interesting. Uh, are they more expressive? I think that when you are using a special technique, you need to acquire uh, deeply uh, skills to um, be expressive. And in that, in that sense, uh, the tra traditional shadow theater uh, have a long history of specialists that know perfectly how to play with the the tools they are working, they are building for um, uh, making theater. So they are very expressive. In that way, we need, uh, with the new av avatars that we are inventing, inv in inventing, we need to practice and to get some skills to be as expressive as the old tradition is. And of course, it's, it's more uh, a stimulation than a competition between two ways of acting together. Thank you very much. Mm. So, okay, yeah. maybe the question of SIP, or maybe another question. Yes. yes no. Do you think the performance can also manipulate the technical mm. part of the project, the drawing image shadow pipeline? Yes, I think that's a very interesting question because it focuses on the now the the necessity to mix uh, uh, competencies. It's not possible to have uh, an actor or performer uh, 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 not aware of what he's playing with, what he's acting with, because you need to have a close relationship between the digital artists, uh, digital operator, and the performers to uh, achieve in aesthetical uh, interesting results. If the performer is just aside, arriving at the last moment to try to make something with the image, it's not working. He needs to be involved, and it, 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 it can be at, at, at different levels. You can have, uh, can see the the performer that I called mocaptor as a um, complice, as a as a guy who is working deeply with the technicians to improve the the technical setup. Also, he can. Um, discuss with the director or the digital artist to bring some new effects or to find some way of controlling the motion retargeting process to be more expressive or also to get some some acting um, uh, solicitations to invent new effects for the future. This close collaboration, I think, will help a lot uh, having a more expressive uh, uh, way of acting and uh, performances. Okay, last question. I have just a, a small question. 
Uh, George, you introduced some new new jobs and new things uh, with new tools. Uh, I just uh, question about how you manage to collect all the feedback uh, in order to uh, well understand what is changes with your new to new approach and how you can maybe monitor the evolution of so, so such tool in order to cope with the traditional uh, animation theater and so on uh, which way you can uh, figure such uh, such evolution um in fact there is two sides in your question the first one is uh, on a professional level uh, there is a lot of things to do for instance in theater to bring these new tools uh, more um, commonly on stage not as uh, you know um, UFO that are, are arriving and that disturbing the way of traditionally uh, working so uh, it, it will take time to have operator uh, akin to uh, to work with this uh, with these tools and uh, in Paris 8 University, in the uh, theater department, I'm trying to elicit students to explore this side of, of the work. And the other side is uh, how to get audience also um, aware of this new way of uh, acting or making theater. And this is uh, very difficult. Uh, I, I don't know how to do that because you are depending on um, uh, uh, cultural infra infrastructure. But anyway, each time we add some experiences, uh, we have after the show the possibility to exchange with the, the audience and to get some um, uh, feedbacks. And uh, it's always very interesting to, to take time and to, to understand how the, the audience is understanding what happens on stage, what is very new or what is, is not so interesting to, to go on uh, in the exploration. So uh, it's a work in progress, in fact. Okay, so you use some interviews of a citation interview in order to manage the, exp to gather the, the experiences from several parts. Of yes, the... it's, it's for the moment, it's uh, rather uh, informal, but uh, we, um, we, we plan to make it more uh, in a scientific um, uh, way in order to be able to publish some results about that. And we were so deeply uh, focused and concerned with the technical issues for the moment that we uh, uh, didn't take uh, enough time uh, for this second part of um, um, uh, formalizing how it is uh, received. But we will do it. I hope we will do it. Also with Anastasia, Anastasia the, the co-author of the paper, who is going on working on all these different uh, aspects of the theater. Okay. Last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, there, there was a question from Adrian Thomas. Uh, I don't uh, see yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my question is: uh, um, uh, When do you think that this uh, kind of, uh, um, let's say, uh, shadow avatar can evolve? Uh, I would say towards uh, more complex modes of uh, expression and interaction let's say eye tracking hand tracking uh, 3d uh, uh, 3d model of uh, the actors uh, maybe uh, some uh, 3d object manipulation uh, and uh, like a follow-up if you are if you are already experimenting on this kind of uh, uh, evolutions, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the questions. Effectively, uh, when you are entering this kind of uh, of um, of world, the VR world, and also the huge possibilities of effect given by the, um, for instance, the Unreal Engine uh, uh, Unreal Engine Four, of course you can do a lot of things and we are planning to uh, we, we plan to explore a lot of possibilities of ex expression with this kind of avatar and the, the possibilities are very very large are immense and the, the only the the, the the thing that we 
we don't have to, to lose. Um, we have to keep the track of um, keeping um, an homogeneity in the way of using the shadow. So you can develop all the effects that you want in the limits that you respect the fact that it's a specific shadow that can do a lot of things, but is not a normal uh, or a humanoid uh, uh, avatar. And it's just my concern to try to to not being completely um, trying all the possible effects, all the you know very um, very uh, interesting uh, possibilities. And um, to to conclude, there is also the connection between the physical uh, actor and the and the and the three D. And on this level, there is also a lot of things to do. Uh, and I'm trying also to. To, um, to see this project in a way of sharing uh, in, um, in, uh, immersive, in an immersive way with uh, spectators, having also perhaps their own shadow, a closer collaboration with someone on stage with also a shadow, but telling the story in an immersive uh, environment. But it's a beginning project and we hope also to to welcome all the people that are interesting to share here or to develop it uh, in in a, his or her own uh, directions. It's an open project. Okay, so, thank you very much for your answer. So thanks for your tour for George and Anastasia. Uh, I think Anastasia is also in the room, so you can ask yes. a question in a in private way after after it. You can upload. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And Lo, what is the next, next conference? Uh, yes, so the, the next conference is about a f very famous um, uh, picture, uh, and uh, it's called the Mona Via, creating an experience, an artistic and expressive queuing simulator. And so I think it's uh, presented by Maëlys Jousseau. Uh, I think... You can raise your hand. Um, uh, yes, I'm here. And I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Okay. Uh, actually, the, the two of us are presenting together. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. We, and so... we live together, so we're both on the same microphone. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I but don't you know how you <laughs> raise your hand. I'm just going to dance so people can see me. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, so um, okay. So you have 20 minutes of presentation, three, uh, following by 10 minutes of question and exchanges. All right. OK. Uh, shall we start now? Yes. OK. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, to Level Virtual for allowing us to present our work here today. Um, so my name is Maggie Jusso, and I'm a PhD student at University Paris 8 at INREV Laboratory, and I'm also a researcher at Minsar Bioposcope, an exert tech startup in Paris. And my PhD research deals with the application of XR technologies to cultural heritage. And I am Piers Bishop, uh, also a PhD student at INREV, and my work is more focused on the experience of video games. We are here to talk about a VR project we created called Mona VR. Uh, as you can guess, it's centered around the famous painting Mona Lisa. So let's talk about that for a bit. So, um, okay, so the whole experience is based on one obvious observation. The Louvre has a Mona Lisa problem. So the painting is more and more victim of its success, attracting huge crowds in rooms that are not designed to welcome so many people. So for security reasons, the Louvre tried since October 2019 to make people queue through barriers like Disneyland to see the painting. But even there, uh, after waiting 15 minutes, you only get under a minute to take your pictures and occasionally <laughs> look at the painting. And over that time, you are uh, literally ushered out. Um, and the whole time of this, there is, you know, a permanent heavy nose, like you were in the crowded station, which is kind of exhausting. So to try and find alternative, uh, VR experiences that propose to be alone with Mona Lisa have already been in investigated um, by the Louvre himself, for example. And this is the second element on which the whole experience is based. One day with Pierce, uh, we were musing over the question of authenticity, uh, which is kind of very important in my, in my thesis. 
And we were talking about these VR experiences, you know, and at the time I said something like these experiences allowed for a more authentic experience. To which Pierce asked, would the current experience of seeing Mona Lisa, that is to say with the crowd and the noise, be a more authentic experience today? So at the start, of course, that was a joke, okay? We were musing over the idea and then we really felt like doing an actual VR experience about it. First, well, because we love doing subversive and funny experiences. Um, technically here, we like to propose to do something extremely boring, but in VR. <laughs> and in the end, uh, it really triggers real questions such as our relation to authenticity in regard to XR technologies. But before I go further, we want to be really clear on one point. This is absolutely not a criticism of the Louvre Museum, for which we have the utmost respect. And we know that this situation is as unpleasant for them as it is for the visitors. So we are just basically playing around with a tool that we love, which is a, uh, VR. So um, first, let's talk about uh, digital and physical Mona Lisa. So as I was saying, um, several VR experiences have already been made about Mona Lisa. So in 2015, uh, you can see, uh, I'm just going to take my little pointer right here. Um, in 2015, Luis Tejeda made a virtual restitution at the Salle des Etats before its, re its restoration in 2019. And in 2019, uh, in the framework of the Leonardo da Vinci exhibition, uh, Emissive Studio created Mona Lisa Beyond Glass, where you can get to meet Lisa Gardini in person. And personally, I think it's really a beautiful and poetic, poetic experience with um, remarkable balance between artistic reinterpretation and scientific information about the painting. So basically, both of, both of these experiences enable a direct contact with Mona Lisa without the crowd and the oppressive situation. But as unpleasant as it is, why couldn't we consider the current experience of visiting Mona Lisa an actual and authentic experience? Um, what guarantees the authenticity living Mona Lisa in this particular context? Is it to watch it alone in intimacy and take all the time to unravel its secrets? Or is it to be surrounded by a crowd of all attracted by its celebrity? <laughs> So in this idea, I am particularly fond um, of Bruno Latour and Adam Lowe's idea of a work of art having a career. That is to say, a trajectory through time. Um, it's actually the history of reception of the work of art. Yves Genret uh, roughly evokes the same idea when he talks about cultural objects as cultural beings that do not remain shut upon themselves, but circulate and pass through the hands and minds of people. So it means basically that nothing is transmitted from a generation to the other without having been changed in the process. And in this perspective, we can totally argue that the, the context of reception of Mona Lisa in 2020, so right here, is as authentic as the context of the, seventh, the 16th century uh, when it was hung in François Premier's bathroom. As a matter of fact, the context of reception of Mona Lisa in 2020 say something of the painting and on the role it has in the eyes and minds of millions of people through the world. Ultimately, I think it says something of the 21st century society. So that's why contrary to uh, what has been done before, we particularly chose to embrace this configuration of the painting's career. So first, we really went to immerse ourselves in the atmosphere of the Salle des Etats, well, obviously, when the Louvre was still accessible, right? <laughs> and we observed the people, the noise, the moving patterns through the room. And we noticed, for example, that nobody looks at the other paintings. They are crushed by Mona Lisa's presence. And to represent this, we chose um, to blur the other paintings in the room, with one exception that will be talked about later by peers. Another crucial element of the experience is, of course, taking photographs and selfies, uh, which, is, which are very representative of our time. And in Mona VR, uh, you, can have a, you have a smartphone in your hand right here, and you can use it either to take pictures or selfies. And um, you are represented um, by an emoji, uh, which is a symbol of the, ubiqu the ubiquity of social media and the essential practice of sharing one's experience with a larger community. 
And we also put, you know, in the room, we put photograph sounds, which encourage to do the same, to take pictures and which convey that feeling of a collective experience, which is in the end, absolutely what seeing Mona Lisa means today. It means being immersed in a collectivity of people receiving the painting at the same time as we do. Now, I'll be uh, describing the technical parts a little bit. Uh, mostly how we went to recreating this whole experience. So it started with recreating the Sep des Etats, which is the name of the room where uh, the Mona Lisa is exhibited. And um, yeah, just recreating it in, uh, in 3D to uh, put it in unity. Uh, the room plans and measurements are based on the Louvre's own official floor plans. Uh, the room has its very recent uh, Prussian blue coat of paint, which dates from last October. Um, and uh, yeah, we can also uh, see a bit of the rooms next to the uh, Salle des Etats, uh, namely the Grande Galerie and the Salle de Nantes. Uh, so the view uh, is from uh, the view we can see here and where we decided to put the visitor, the user, uh, is roughly in the, the bottom part of this room here, uh, right in front of the Nose de Canet, since that's the direction from which most of the visitors will be coming to the room. Um, as previously mentioned, uh, the experience is centered on Mona Lisa, and since all of the other paintings were blurred, that allowed us some uh, liberties. Um, so here are some examples of the paintings we chose. Uh, some are historical, but aren't in the museum, uh, such as Manet Olympia, pictured here. Some are screenshots or promotional materials from some uh, movies or, or video games that we really liked, uh, like uh, Skyrim or The Lord of the Rings with this amazing artwork by John Howe. Um, next slide, please. Uh, there is a special case, though, with the paintings, uh, which is the uh, Nozze di Cana. Um, wait, that's over there. Uh, as mentioned, the painting is set up right in front of the Mona Lisa, and it is absolutely massive. It's the largest painting in the museum. Uh, despite the Mona Lisa's presence, it does get some amount of attention, but even that isn't much to talk about. Um, to show this, a specific shader was developed, displaying a blurred vision of the painting for the most part, but when looking towards the painting, a certain portion of it will appear normally around the user's gaze. The crowd um, was generated using freely uh, available character models. Um, they have uh, randomly selected textures and are spread throughout the room using various density parameters. Uh, all of the characters have the same idol animation and are oriented in Mona Lisa's general direction. A far better crowd could have been possible, but it would require a much higher vari variety of character models and animations. So these would have either required us to make them ourselves, which would have taken way too much time, or we would have been required to purchase them, which we may do in the future, depending on what we want to do with the product. Uh, in addition, a proper crowd behavioral system could be explored with characters moving around, entering and leaving the room and so on. Um, audio recordings of the actual Cell des Etats are played throughout the room, uh, helping the player into full immersion. Um, okay, we've got animated GIFs on here, so I hope these will uh, be displayed properly. Uh, I'm going to be describing them anyway. Yeah, they get better. Um, so about the queuing, uh, which is one of the central parts of this experience. Uh, basically, near the uh, starting area, there, there is a sign, uh, which you may have seen for a fraction of a second. Um, with the, uh, there is, with the, the hand, the user's hand is touching a sign and there's a sort of loading wheel uh, animated around it and uh, that sets the player to queuing. Um, 
so the the queue uh, in itself is uh, a series of teleportations throughout the crowd. Uh, we chose to opt for a teleportation system uh, for various reasons, but the main of which being that the experience should be centered on Mona and making the user free of their movements would counter that intention. In the real cell desita, the queue lasts for about 10 minutes and what's at the end, you only get 30 to 40 seconds to have a look at Mona Lisa and uh, take a couple of pictures before being kicked out. In uh, our VR experience, we shortened both of these times to around two minutes of queuing and 10 seconds of picture taking, but this feels longer than it really is uh, because, well, you've got nothing to do, so you get bored. <laughs> um, it's really a shame that you can't get the animations properly. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll type in the YouTube URL to uh, a video recording of the uh, Mona Lisa experience uh, after, the, after the presentation. Maybe you so can there is it. another feature to... You were saying, Vincent? Yes, maybe you can add it in public chat. Yeah, I, I'll do that, right. So, Pierce, you can okay. continue. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm taking my headphones off because otherwise I get an echo of myself since I'm talking in May Lisa's microphone. So uh, back to the presentation. Uh, so there is another feature central to the experience and probably the most important one. In the right hand, the user is holding a smartphone capable of taking pictures and selfies. Uh, when in selfie mode, the user's head and other hand are replaced with emojis, as was mentioned by uh, Maybe Celia. And uh, a shutter sound effect is played when taking a picture, but that sound effect is also played uh, throughout the room at frequent random intervals, um, as mentioned earlier, to incite the user to take pictures of their own. So here are some examples of pictures that are taken uh, in the application. Uh, the pictures are saved onto the hard drive next to the application's files for any potential future uses. Uh, one of these potential future uses could be to set up a Twitter bot to share these pictures along with generated messages and predetermined hashtags. Um, it would allow the virtual visit to have the same impact as a real one would uh, culminating in a silly Twitter post. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, I'd like to say that the whole question of this experience uh, was obviously not to argue whether the physical experience was, was better than the digital one because it's more authentic or even to say that an experience is better than another one because it's considered as more authentic. It, it was not the question. The question was, it was really a discussion about the questions of authenticity and context themselves. But there's another idea that came in light of the current COVID situation. When creating this experience, we thought that maybe one day it would be a witness of a past situation, a restitution of a past context. The time where you had to queue through barriers to see Mona Lisa in a blue, a Prussian blue setting. Today, in a way, this has happened. Our Mona VR project is an experience that allows you to leave the experience of seeing Mona Lisa at the Louvre during this period where it is impossible, which stresses obviously the advantage of VR for cultural heritage for accessibility reasons. Also, it creates a very interesting relation to past, present and future. You could also think that this experience is basically a critic of VR itself and that it actually advocates for a living culture heritage alone and never reproduce it in VR because it's just useless. But it's actually the complete opposite. We believe, and that is the essence of my thesis work, that XR technologies have a fantastic power to stress out things that seem obvious today. By recreating them in another world, we have another chance to look at things in a whole new perspective. By recreating a situation within its own rules, but in another context, for example, typically queuing to see Mona Lisa in your living room, exaggerating these rules allows for a new perspective. And typically the first thing that Pierce did in Mona Lisa experience was jump and dance around, but the whole time we were in the Louvre, we never thought of that. So in the same perspective, breaking the rules is to better understand them is even more interesting. 
So I'd like to uh, make a little teasing about of one uh, of our future projects that we're working on, the uh, uh, workshop of destruction of cultural heritage. <laughs> so there's another core notion of um, heritage that is lying under Mona VR queuing simulator, which is quite obvious, sacredness of museums and heritage, with Mona being exhibited in a structure that obviously looks like a Greek temple. So the problematic of the uh, destruction workshop is to reflect upon the sacredness of museums and heritage. And um, the idea here was to push the idea of reversing a situation, of breaking the rules to better understand them. Push yourself to do something that you would never ever do in reality, even if you were allowed to do it, or if you were a terrorist. Destroy cultural heritage. How does it feel and why does it feel this way? Um, oh. To take 30 seconds to describe the videos that you're supposed to be seeing, uh, which are uh, basically the VR user grabbing ancient vases and smashing them on the ground or throw the, throwing them at statues to make them explode in a bunch of pieces. Yeah, right, because we don't see it well on the, on the GIFs. And you can slash uh, paintings and, you know, can basically uh, uh, I'm just showing you this one. Uh, I hope we will be seeing, yeah, you can slash, take a cutter, you know, or a knife and slash through paintings. So this is a kind of a wink <laughs> to Mona Lisa. But I, I, I must repeat that I absolutely love cultural heritage and museum, right? It's just something to play with our relationship to heritage. Next, just okay. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Maylis. Could you just uh, put the link of uh, your mm -hmm. YouTube uh, video mm -hmm. in the public uh, chat in order to make uh, to make it accessible to the public? And now yeah. it's a question time. <laughs> Have you any question for the room? Maybe you can write it down on the public chat. Oops. Uh, yeah. Oh, you can raise hand also. No question. <laughs> okay. Well, I certainly hope you you like it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. Put put the link and uh, yeah, and then, I just uh, uh, I it. have just one question of our one question on your work. Uh, I think the there is several kind of approach on your work uh, because you have one approach is uh, how to retranscribe uh, the experiences of the actual uh, Mona Lisa exhibition in the Louvre but you have also some interaction and also the social aspect around mm -hmm. uh, this and it's quite merged and um, I just want to know which methodology you use in order to collect all the things that you choose to to retranscribe your uh, experiences of the experiences of Mona Lisa, and uh, why uh, had it the uh, social aspect, and uh, how you design things uh, in order to to and how how also you uh, and why you the social aspect and all the things are, are for you emblematic for this uh, for our period actual um all right maybe i'll, I'll start uh, because so if i understood your question well yes the first thing we did <laughs> the first thing we did was as i said uh going to the loo uh, going to the Mona Lisa room and, uh, you know, immerse ourselves and trying to really get the essence of what we were living, actually. Um, the the noise, we really, we recorded the noises, we made some videos and we observed, you, you know, how people were reacting. And so we didn't have the strength to do the cue. <laughs> actually, we... <laughs> We couldn't do that because it was just too long and we just were exhausted uh, 
after 10 minutes. Uh, but we we really uh, we even talked, you know, with the agents that were there to, um, you know, to monitor things. And we talked with her for uh, quite a long time and she explained the situation and how the museum staff was leaving it too. So this was how we did it. And then, um, yeah, we decided to add the social part because uh, we really realized that um, even the fact that people don't look at Mona Lisa, it, you just spend uh, 10 minutes in the queue uh, and then when you arrive in front of Mona Lisa, people see it through their smartphone. They don't watch it because they can't, they don't have the time. So the, um, the phone part and the sharing part is crucial. It's just crucial because everyone uh, wants to picture themselves with a celebrity, which is Mona Lisa. And in the uh, museum, uh, uh, in the museum vocabulary, we talk about, I don't know how to say that in English, but celebration visit. It's the fact that to show yourself with a celebrity, uh, which is a work of art. So um, I'll just link with a question I saw um in the in the public comments that we didn't really do an analysis of the impact of the experience of the users because you know it was a kind of yeah private project and we um we the one question is really chat <laughs> yeah no, there are several <laughs> yeah yeah there are several questions um and so we we didn't really do an analysis on the impact because it was much more of a reflection on the the notion of authenticity and all of these things but we um we made it public we shared the uh, the experience on our public page so people can download it and uh, hopefully if you have a vr headset you can leave it and hopefully share it and share your experience so yeah we will be much uh, interested to see what people feel and how they feel it um to answer the other question from Regina in the um, in the chat, the last project we smashed the objects is called L'Atelier de Destruction du Patrimoine, but it's still a work in progress. Uh, we should be done with it in a week or two. Uh, you can follow Maybes on Twitter, uh, maybe so you can type your Twitter yeah. account um, to get some news about it and uh, see uh, what it is. Um, there is also a question about uh, summarize the benefit of virtual culture heritage. Well, <laughs> I could point you to um, a certain number of articles that I wrote about this. Uh, I'll put them also into the public chat. I see um, particularly three particular uh, interests of XR technologies to cultural heritage. First is the question, of course, of accessibility, as we've seen. So in the COVID situation, but also in normal situations uh, on archaeological sites or even monuments that people can access in reality. For example, I'm thinking about uh, getting on top of the uh, Strasbourg Cathedral or visiting Cheops um, in VR, oh. which is uh, some, some parts are impossible to visit in reality. So this is basically one of the first interests of uh, XR. The second I see is to restitute the context. Um, so to, uh, yeah, to basically uh, restitute the former state of uh, an object or uh, to give more information about what you think. You, so it can be a, res a virtual restitution of um, a state, for example, in the fourth, uh, fourth century, but it can also be just displaying um, data on what you're seeing in real time and the third aspect i see is really that uh, xr technologies can provide different approaches and more um, new approaches of cultural heritage that sometimes might be more um, emotional or artistic well knowing that in each case i'm really um I'm really convinced of the necessity that the public always has to know what they're looking at and what is real, what is reinterpreted, what is artistic. But uh, I think it really, you know, it gives um, another proximity with the object and another way to apprehend the object, which are not necessarily only cognitive, but also emotional. And what is the opinion of archaeological and museum creators? Well, we did, yes, I didn't show them. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't show them. It was, you know, it's it's really in the process of my thesis. Uh, I like using XR technologies as a personal tool to question my own relation to heritage, which is 
kind of classical because I come from a history of art formation. I met the Ecole, the Ecole du Louvre. So um, I'm really in from a classical formation and I like to deconstruct my own relation to cultural heritage to better understand what it means to us as humans, you know, the, our relation to death, our relation to sacred. And uh, I really think that XR technologies are you know, a good way to deconstruct the, the rules because it doesn't hurt the objects. Thank you. Thank you. So the next presentation. Thank you, Maëlys. We can applaud for your presentation and for your work and for the future work. And uh, I think we very some yes, more destructive things coming. <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> Uh, the next speaker is uh, Suzanne Beer. Maybe, uh, Suzanne, could you go to the screen and prepare your presentation? Okay. Screen. Okay. So the next presentation is real body and virtual body uh, evaluation. It's a, a presentation uh, quite uh, different that we have habit because it's a presentation on the uh, scope of philosophy and psychology, I think. Yes, that's right. This is your presentation. Oh, I don't see anything. It's a blank board for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's it. That's it. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's it. OK, All right. perfect. So, you just ask next slide, and then I can push. Sorry. Fine. So here I'm going to talk about the relationship between virtual bodies and real bodies, and find that they're going to be in the hybridization of virtual, mental virtual bodies and real bodies. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So, um, in computer graphics and VR sciences, virtual bodies is a syntagma referring to a computer-generated three-dimensional appearance of a human body. Opposite is the real body, body belonging to a living person. I want to argue that dualistic approach opposing computer beings and physical beings under a hybrid reality. A personal virtual body is interacting with the interact virtual a virtual body can really exist as such only when it is inhabited by a projection of a real body. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Okay. So, however, what is a real body? Persons don't live in a, I mean, they don't live themselves as having real bodies. They have self bodies inheriting the distinction between being an organism, obeying biological, physiological laws, and embodying their individual body in more or less conscious states by perceiving and acting, which is living one's body. A real body is not just a thing in the world, but it lies in an intentional world. It is itself a manifestation of a subjectivity. Therefore, a real body is a connector of subjectivity inside the physical world. A real body is a body, is a body self for the person. It interiorizes computer virtual bodies as parts or prolongations of their beings. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah? Yes. So our focus is going to be a non-mechanical understanding, starting from a first person point of view, opening a non-objective psychological approach to VR beings. We start from the idea that virtual reality can only be a reality if it's a representation made by a person's mental state, and therefore a real body must be the body belonging to a living person, which has a hybrid nature coming from many virtual sources searching for their reality. Um, next slide, please. So yes. we're going to enter the, the development, sorry, 
that's the first part. So the next slide is going to show. Um. Yeah, okay. Uh, reality is itself a central point in VR, AR, or MR. The will to transform reality appearances by virtual projections, make illusions by intertwining virtual and physical objects, make a completely synthetic reality, shows reality is taken as a primal reality, and a second reality, a synthetic one, is added, included, or excluded in order to bring forth another kind of reality. Um, next slide, please. So the yes. first kind, yeah, the first kind of reality is the inclusive perspective of VR, in which virtual reality as an artificial reality is hierarchically depending of natural reality. In this sense, VR would bring a poorer reality, eventually a false one, which is shown by the next possibility in which VR can produce an exclusive kind of reality standing outside any relation to the real world as a simulator. It really would have no reality outside of its world. And from a natural reality point of view, it's a manipulative pseudo reality. Thank you. Um, next one, please. Yes. All right, so a last line of understanding of reality is what VR is. VR is understood as a composable reality. As Nani Pieris observes, virtual reality as natural reality are two types of possible environments which have been actualized. VR is made just like natural reality, thanks to technological progress, this produced and constitutes other possible environments, alternative to physical ones, and they are as real as them. Yeah, next one, please. Oh, there is an animation. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, therefore, reality does not stand as an invariant outside humans' reach, against which knowledge is evaluated. As a VR concept, as a concept of VR, um, it is a um, subjective stance. And in its concepts of VR, Fuchs states that the purpose of virtual reality is to make possible a sensory motor and cognitive activity for a person in a digitally created artificial world. And reality of the body is then taken in a neuroscientific way as getting an experience of reality given by sensors, motor impulsions and perceptions, proprioception, somatic perception, and so on. Presence is a subjective quality objectively conceived. Uh, next one, please. Yes. So one can see that presence is the essential factor which characterizes what VR devices much cause in real bodies. For Steuer, a virtual reality is defined as a real or simulated environment in which perceiver experiences telepresence. The experience of presence is more like a sensation related to a state of body and mind, the sense of being there. And Slater adds that it is when the self agrees not taking into account the difference between one's body environment and a mediated environment, that sense of presence is achieved in an artificial world, which means that when the self agrees are not taking into account the difference between one's body environment and a mediated environment, that sense of presence is achieved in the artificial world. Therefore, it is through body experience that the user feels its presence. A real body is an embodied body, a body possibly embodied in a virtual body. And an embodied body is what gives this feeling of presence, turning a virtual reality into a real one. As suspending its belief. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Amato analyzes what it is as a virtualizing process, and it is constructing corporality. Real bodies enter virtual worlds through embodiments by inserting machine controls into their nervous schemas, 
and insensating perceptual and active senses. And conversely, the machine insensiates what is necessary for this embodiment. Different sensory motor cognitive inputs must be coherent on uh, and coherent on an up, down, and done up scale. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So, in this analogy conception, real bodies are embodied intentional, intentional subjects. A real body is the point of a subjectivity and a, and a shell that VR encounters to make changes in the subjectivity. Interaction with schemas and images are achieved through external causes. However, we do not understand yet what happens in this intentionality, how it can accept a suspension of disbelief. For us, it is more than a question of plausible sensory motor cognitive inputs. And we would like to speculate what happens in the body-self relation on an exclusive subjective side when a real body is immersed in a virtual body and see why virtual bodies can embody can be embodied in a mental way. Uh, next slide, please. So next um, is the second part in which we are going to see how in um, neurosciences, a virtual body and already been con conceived through the carrier's uh, body conception. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Yeah. Um, in the first step, I'm sorry, I think it's the next one. Next one, okay. I think so, yeah. Sorry, but yeah. In the first step, visualization of real body in a virtual body is explained in a neuroscientific way by presence of a mirror of the body inside of the neurological activity as a body double. It is what Bartos has called the vicarious body. A double ganger, a ghost double, a ghost double of a living person exists inside humans' brains as a represented double of the person's body. It synthesizes represented body spaces in an inner schema of one's own body. This model of one's body is a vicarious body. It is able of vicarious alternative representations of real body's movements in the world and can invent new ways of realizing actions. Berto's vicarious definition says that it is um, an ambiguous, I mean, it's, it's what pushes to two sides, it's a projection of a denomination in the world, and vicariance is like a virtual, a virtual quality inside of a, of a body and inside of a brain. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So, this double of a body is like a virtual body inside the brain. It processes data coming from diverse sensory motor, environmental, social sources and joins them to instantiate an action. This happens in an unmediated world. But in fact, the absence of mediation is a lure. Everyone has had to learn the different controls, giving them power to act in the real world. So the vicarious body is able of vicarious alternative representation which can invent new ways of realizing, realizing actions as a kind of a computer double body inside of everyone's brains. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. One can therefore identify natural world with virtual ones and make analogies between the models inside of a brain and the ones inside of a computer. Uh, Next slide, please. Oh. Yes. Yes, just a second. So, um, so for Bertos, there is a superior power of success, suggestion of VR over novels because VR gets the same structure as brain. VR is able to give a much stronger sense of presence than any other artistic media, 
He writes that the capacity of the human brain to imagine, imagine itself together with its feeling body in a virtual world is a major discovery that goes far beyond the well-known feeling of entering a fictional world when you're reading a novel. Next one, please. Yes. Um, he explained this difference as lying in the mixture of reality and virtuality in some digital worlds. RV brings physical inputs with cognitive ones, which build such a realistic perception that it's difficult for the player to avoid symbiosis with instantiation of the game avatar or subjective camera in the virtual environment. The mind of the user is inside a VR world in a mental and embodied way. In doing so, the body schema and image in the brain represent an extension of the real body inside the virtual world. Body double has been interjected by a virtual world as if it were a real augmentation of its being. This fact is shown by famous experiences, like the one of the rubber hand illusion, where part of one's body or is taken as an or another part of I mean, a part of one's body as another part of the body inside of the world, virtual world is placed in a concordant sensory motor input and hence gives a sense of ownership of the body, of the virtual body inside of one owns body. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and there are lots of scientific proofs for that. The current brain and embodiment are proved uh, through IRMs. They're studied from a neuropsychological perspective and they show connections between behaviors and activated brain areas when interaction with virtual body doubles. And one can also explain it by mirror neuro neurons which are physiological entities cap capable of mirroring bodies and perceptions and motions. It demonstrates that a real body can embody a virtual body because it already possesses a kind of virtual body inside of it, vicarious body inside of its vicarious brain. Um, next slide, please. So in the, yes. third, uh, in the third part, we're gonna see what uh, I am actually, um, um, developing is which is a virtual self body and an interactive virtual body hybrids a mental a properly mental and imaginative virtual body inside of of um, everyone's subjectivity so uh, next slide please yes and this is another perspective than the idea of vicarians which belongs more to medical cognitive perspective than a phenomenological one um so next slide please yes so we're first going to see the phenomenolo phenomenological perspective which um starts the study of embodiment of the real body from the body self the living body or body proper of merleau ponty his thought is integrated in cognitive sciences but still one has to look through a side which is not an objectifying one in Phenomenology of Perception, Paolo Ponti gives a description of mental movements and body proper perceptions produced while watching a theater performance. The spectator projects himself in the body of comedians and into the fictional environment performed on stage. He writes, this virtual body moves the real body to the point that the subject no longer feels in the world where he really is and that instead of his true legs and arms, he feels the legs and arms that one would have for walking in the reflected room. He lives in the performance. Merleau-Ponty shows that our body perceptions can include imaginary ones as if they were real. Body proper will exist as what he calls virtual bodies. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So what's the sense of this virtual body, which is not a vicarious sense? Sense of a total of virtual body in Merleau-Ponty's uh, analysis is a, a part of perception of one's personal body and has nothing to do with VR. It was 
well time, well beyond the time of its discovery. Philosopher calls this felt imaginary body a virtual body to make a difference with a body having perceptions from the real world. An imaginative body is mentally embodied. In the theater case, it has a material stand included in the imaginary world. Still, imagination is as understood as opposite to reality. And the concept of virtual body in Rollo Ponti's reflection means that the synthesis of felt body is made with a purely mental source, not a mixed source mixed with perception from sensorial reality. Therefore, a virtual body is different of a vicarious body since it defines itself as coming from an imaginative input, a mental input, and has no natural adaptive goal. And I have next one, please. Yes. So we want to extend Marlo Ponti's point. Imagination, irrationality is an important sense to understand what happens in the self during interaction with the virtual body. Having virtual body as a body proper as oneself is being unrealistically and freely projecting self body into images and worlds which are unfit. Merleau-Ponty reduces virtual body as exact one only when it's projected in virtual beings. However, one can conceive mental virtual body in every perception of the self as much as um, real ones, as much as imaginary ones. One way of seeing the importance of a virtual body in humans' mental existence is shown by the importance of imagination in embodiment interactions. Penanagi analyzes how interactive virt virtual bodies, computer virtual bodies, drive self body in the identity in the study um, in the half imaginary, half realistic, persistent world experience made in second life. It showed an influence of avatar identity on personal identity. He writes that the user alters perception of one's own self, which may also involve the purchase decision processes. Its buying actions indicated that avatar virtual body, especially when not realistic, made one live in an imaginary world up to the point that the self would transform one's action in order to express a new virtual self. Uh, next uh, slide. Yes. A uh, virtual self opens a body proper perception towards a dreamed and desired image and action of the self. This happened in MMORPG, in which body proper are fantasized into virtual worlds and imaginary worlds. Distinguishing purely mentalizing media with highly immersive VR, because sensory motor inputs are so powerful, does not see the incidence of imagination itself to capture one's full attention to the point that the virtual body comes to existence in one's body self. In a body proper virtual being, imagination gives way to ownership of other, of other sensations without restricting it to a specific media. The imagined identities identified by self-customers avatars bring about a clear occurrence of presence of virtual embodiments in one's mind. Um, next, please. Yes. From the very, uh, very early age of computer and internet use, Sherry Turkle has shown how users project a multiple identity on computer entities. In Life on the Screen, she concludes, what is the self when it divides into its labors amongst its constituents are alters? Those burdened by traumatic dissociative disorders yes. suffer these questions. What? No, it's okay. Yeah? Okay. Um, so those burdened by post-traumatic dissociative disorders suffer these questions. Here, I have suggested that inhabitants of virtual communities play with them. The self is not basically unitary, and it is a complex tinkering of mo mobile centers of personification. Interactive virtual selves are lived through virtual body incarnations as an image giving a social identity, an environmental one, and a personal one. Imaginary selves produced by users in video games project identity complexity. Virtual body selves 
are virtual selves embodiments which combine themselves to constitute an actual body self. Um, next slide, please. And this yes. is a very psychoanalytical um, consequence. And psychoanalysis is going to make us understand how imagination is making our identity. Uh, the importance of mental virtual images in identifying one's real body is clear. In psychoanalytical theory, um, it is demonstrated that virtuality is literally a part of self-construction. Along Freud's famous mirror stage conception, Lacan has specifically searched how the body, which is a partly internal, partly external entity, is invested by the self. One's real body only becomes one self body through specular image. This image in a mirror is namely a virtual image. It identifies the reflected organic body as being the subject's body, different, differing, differing from the other people's bodies and from the image that others give of the one's self body. Therefore, identification of the personal body through the looking glass is the first step of acquisition, of acquiring an image. And a real body refers to a sense which is out of reach. So reality is out of reach of oneself. A real body is what is a desired body and mixed with the imagined and the symbolized body. And there's mediation of symbolized and desired body is made by specular images and by virtual images. Um, thank you. Can you have next slide, please? Yes. Um, excuse me. Uh, there is uh, yeah? just one. Uh, there is ju just two minutes left. Oh, um, sorry, I don't understand. Um, uh, there is two minutes left. Uh, you are a little bit late. Just that. <laughs> oh, two minutes. Yeah. Oh, all right. Sorry. So I'm going to so. So, um, so one can see where is the hybridization. Can uh, um, well, um, so let's go to conclusion. Conclusion oh. slides. Okay. Uh -huh. So, in um, just a sec. In conclusion, what we have done um, is going from this um, going from uh, an objective uh, virtual body in VR as technological bodies with inception of interactivity and sensation of subjective requirements. We're going to mixing technological virtuality and specular virtuality. Virtual bodies as being hybridations of one's mental virtual bodies and interactive virtual bodies, which make one self body, a symbiotic, peculiar virtual real bodies relation. Can I have the last slide, please? Yes. Yeah, all right. So this slide shows how, um, how this multiple identity coming from uh, inside of one's own mind, projecting into the virtual world, comes back into uh, enriching one's, um, one's virtual identity and therefore one's own mental identity. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You can uh, applaud. Okay, we just need to be very quick for the question, uh, but we have time to have some uh, exchange. Uh, Anybody want to ask a question? Yes, I have one hand raised. Maybe, yes, Beatrice? No, sorry, mistake, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. I have just a question and, and remark on uh, on this work. Um, yeah. You ask about hybridation of body, uh, and I think it's also interesting to uh, analyze uh, the body 
and also the emotions and personality between uh, uh, that reflect the body. Uh, have you some work on uh, references uh, which also include the omissional parts of the ebullition between the body and uh, between the real world and virtual world? Or is it something too, too early on your research? And, uh, <laughs> well, yes, because um, uh, I'm thinking very general terms. Huh? So, uh, of course, you can see that Olan has already made it um, really mixing, hybridating uh, huh? virtual bodies and real bodies by incorporating virtual bodies inside of her real body huh? and vice versa. This is quite an old work. And you, but one can see these studies in dance and in theater in which uh, playing with the virtual body, embodying virtual body with real body and vice versa, and uh, and um, yeah, uh, makes hybrids which are very important for them and they include emotions, emotional world. And I think this mixing, the hybridization of these two levels is very important for theater and dance and probably also singing and uh, all the arts mixed together, body and imagination and emotions. Okay. Other question? So, so I don't have a sight on the schedule, but I think we are just quite late. Maybe we will go to the next presentation. Hello? Okay. Thank you for your work. Thank you. I, I have just, sorry, because I see one hand rises by Killian Fleury. Maybe you can have one question. Last one. Um, yeah. Um, yes. Could, could it be possible to move uh, a part of our body that doesn't exist in reality, like a virtual thing or something like that? Like this? Oh, sorry. There's a noise, I can't really yes, hear yes, what you're I, saying. Yes, yes, I try to identify where the noise. <laughs> could, could you switch your mic off, maybe? Yes? Suzanne? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have this. It's a very weird word for, now, for me now. I don't have the... Oh, yes, just a second, I found it. Uh, in preferences, yeah? Maybe, Kylian, you can okay. re-ask your question? Yes. Um, yeah, uh, could it be possible to move uh, a part of our body that doesn't, that doesn't exist in reality in the virtual world, like virtual wings or something like this? I, I mean, it looks like it's, it's very possible because um, in a brain, in a brain, I mean, understanding from a brain perspective, it's just projecting body schema onto another part of its body, which is um, I mean, it gets appropriation and it needs apprenticeship to be able to use these virtual wings. Uh, surely it takes time to be able to use these wings, but uh, it seems very sure. And uh, when you're doing uh, this experiment with, um, um, you know, with this uh, thing you put around the brain and you have to move the mouse, uh, a virtual mouse with just your brain activity, uh, you can see how it becomes a part of yourself and you're making yourself able to move just with your brain, just with your attention inside of a virtual world. I mean, in this in this uh, sense, without anybody, I mean, with nobody, you are able to just move inside a virtual brain, a uh, virtual world, sorry. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, we go, we thank know. You. Switch to the next presentation. You can have close. I think, yes. I think there is a lot of notes behind this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, maybe we can uh, we can go to the next presentation. Uh, call uh, Mobus Schleif, Beyond the Bound of a Virtual System, Enhancing the Presence and Interaction of VR Player to the Real World of Collaborative virtual reality. Uh, 
Uh, this paper is introduced by Koki Toda. Yes, uh, Koki is actually prepared the presentation. Everything is fine. In English. Okay. Uh, yes. Shall I start? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no, we'll go back to the okay, uh, first so... page. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 introduce myself. Yeah, first uh, hello. slide. Uh, okay, uh, I'll, uh, I'll start uh, my presentation. So, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, I'm Koki Okay, Koktoda. you start the presentation. Everything is fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, I am Koki Toda, an engineer in uh, Media Art Group Levetronic who specializes in uh, uh, electronics, robotics, and VR. First, I really appreciate having a great opportunity to speak our research in such a wonderful virtual place. Today, huh? I'd like to make my presentation, Mobius Life, uh, beyond the bounds of the VR system. Uh, please go to the next page. Yes. Thank you. My presentation is composed of the following sections. Introduction, related works, system, application, and conclusion. Next, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I declare our research concept. In a word, our concept is extending the VR world to the real for collaborative augmented virtuality. Next. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this video uh, describe uh, GIF animation describes uh, overview and performance of our proposing methods, battery window and table to the rear. In short, the first method provides a window or display between the VR and the rear. Players in both sides can see and interact each other through the display. The other method. A teleport to the rear conjures part of the VR world into the rear. This method makes audience feel the VR player comes closer to their feet. Both the VR player and the audience share the same environment. Next. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the main purpose of our research is to propose uh, new me uh, methods for augmented virtuality and interaction between VR and the real. We have set four research goals to achieve our purpose. One, making the VR and real see through with each other. Two, providing bidirectional interactions between VR and the real. Three, bringing the VR player to the real world. And four, Suggesting a sample game of collaborative augmented virtuality. Next. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I, uh, sorry, uh, I will dig into researches or applications concerned to our project. Before fo uh, focusing to each project, I will classify them in four groups. One, uh, capturing and reproducing part of the real world in VR. Two, Mixing VR and the real by superimposing CG models on the actual view. Three, extracting elements of VR content. And four, using display and webcam as interface to VR. Next, please. Thank you. The first approach includes, for example, VR player can catch a real ball, bringing audience to the VR. Or Connecting the doorhouse to digital devices. Next, please. Yes. Thank you. Both of the second methods overlapped the CD content on the VR player site. Next. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, the third group means reproducing the part of the VR player content or experience in an application in the audience area. They showed uh, avatar synchronizing VR player's movement or the scenery in the VR. Next, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, apart from the previous groups, 
the last technique utilizes a simple display and a webcam as an interface to VR. That is, now we need to see the VR world. We decided to apply this method because this approach has possibility to provide uh, new mutual interactions. Besides, it could be implemented with ease. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, in fact, we have already researched, developed, and demonstrated our proposing VR methods in VRCI 19. We have presented a simple VR chat application with using our methods, and some interactions were well received. Next, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, but we have also found some problems. Even just our concept is not imaginable. We did not fully describe our research purposes or tasks in our demo. In addition, some interactions, for example, breaking display, attach ornaments in the VR world, and expression of VR player in the rear are difficult to be understood. Especially about VR player in the rear, we implemented it with a semi-transparent mirror to reflect an image of the VR avatar from flat display. It resulted in weak presence of the VR avatar in the rear. Next, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, in this research, we proposed two methods, virtual window and tape to the rear, and modified them by A, a new usage of virtual window for mutual interaction. B, VR player and audience coexist in the same place with a light field display and RGBD camera. And C, controlling physical objects from the VR. Next, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, here's the image of the system schematic and whole components. We developed applications with Unity 3D for the VR player and for the audiences respectively. Our two applications communicate with each other for synchronization and interaction between the VR and the audience. Next, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, our system uses uh, two VR-ready computers, HTC Vive, a flat display, webcam, and 2D LiDAR uh, connected to the PC for VR application. And light field display looking glass, Arduino Uno, and Intel RealSense D435 are uh, connected to the PC for the audience application. Virtual window consists of the display, webcam, and the 2D LiDAR, where table to the rear does a looking glass, Arduino, and Intel RealSense D435. Looking glass requires additional VR ready PC because of its load to the computer, especially to GPU which means managing VR components and looking glass with a single computer is quite difficult. Next, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, from this side, I will explain the feature, mechanism, and the implementation of our VR methods. Virtual window plays the role of VR, uh, window uh, between the VR and the rear, which enables the VR player and audiences to see and interact with each other. Next. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this window provides a virtual display in VR and a physical one in the real world for subjects in the both area to see the opposite side mutually. It creates a texture uh, on a streaming image from the webcam and pets it to a plate object. Then it also transmits an image from a virtual camera behind the plate to the display for audience. Next. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the display detects where audiences touch with using a 2D LiDAR. Uh, the LiDAR outputs scanned points as a polar coordinate system uh, dealing with the center of the device as its origin. So we need to convert it to the Cartesian coordinates in the screen and as the following processes. One, setting the scanning lens in consideration of the size of the display and the relative position of the 2D LiDAR from the display. Two, uh, calculating the homographic matrix transforming the scanning range to the screen rectangle. Three, converting the detected polar coordinates to the Cartesian coordinates. And four, if the converted point is inside the scanning range set in the wave one, 
multiply the calculated homography matrix in the way to left to it, so that the system acquires touch points in the display. Ah, next, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we derive interaction weights showing an object and touch mutually. The former enables the audience to throw an object into the VR world through the display. When someone throws a soft object to the display, a ball is flied out from the display in the VR area. The latter is a way for the VR player and audiences to touch mutually with each other. We can put our hand into VR directly. Instead, we implemented an alternative solution that audiences can produce a touchable object for a VR player by holding their hands in front of the display. Ah, next please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the other method teleports the real conjures part of the VR world in the real. Next please. Yes. This method makes the VR player appear on the real world. We in fact the biggest reason why we could not express it in our previous research is that an image reflected in a semi-transparent mirror has a weak presence. Now you utilize the light field display, RGB camera, and device to control physical objects for enhancing its presence in the real. Next please. Yes. The VR player cannot directly manipulate his or her avatar shown on the light field display because the VR player is not connected to the PC controlling the light field display. Alternative, alternatively, we realize synchronization between the posture of the VR player and the avatar by communicating the position and angle of the VR player's head and both hands via WebSocket protocol. A uh, WebSocket server is launched in the application for light field display, and it broadcasts all the messages sent from a WebSocket client running in the VR application, VR application. Another WebSocket client is executed in the light field display site to receive the VR player's posture due to gesture synchronization. Next, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, not, not only audiences can see in a three-dimensional image of the VR player, but he or she can also watch the audience sterically. The VR player can see in a point cloud, of, uh, point cloud of the audience area captured with an RGB camera in real time. Our system also matches its scale to actual size, calculated by dividing the application height by its physical size and locates it as fitting to the installing position of the, of the camera. Next, please. Yes. For giving the VR player more inference to the real, okay. the system also enables the VR player to control a few objects in the real world with a VR controller. The VR application can also send input to the VR controller via WebSocket. Then the application for the light field display receives it and controls an Arduino connected to a USB port. Next, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I show uh, our. So uh, in this, uh, from this side, I will show our demonstration game to which our VR methods are applied. It composed of three stages where a VR player and audiences can collaborate and enjoy with each other. The goal of this game is for a virtual character performed by a VR player to escape from a small room displayed through the virtual window. All participants play the following three stages. A wall break. B get open and see welcome to the real world next please yes the first stage is a sim uh, simple shooting game uh, the VR player can uh, break them by picking up the gun and shooting the bullet and the audience can help it by throwing an object to the display 
then the ball flying out of the display, uh, virtual window uh, will break targets when it hits. We impose a common task, uh, destroy operating walls not to be squeezed in the first stage. Next, next please. Yes. Thank you. The next stage orders the VR player and audiences holding up their hands to the same place. First, the audiences need to put their hands in front of the display for serving a touchable object in VR. Next, the VR player touches it and then both keep their actions for three seconds to proceed to the next stage. Our next slide, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, on the last stage, uh, so sorry, go, go back, go back to the uh, previous. Go back, okay. Go uh, back. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, no problem. Sorry. Ah, yes, that, that's right. Yes. On the Slide. last stage. Ah, yes, that's right. Uh, that's, this right is the uh, uh, light, the right. Correct, uh, okay. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, on the last stage, we express tape uh, teleport by rendering the real world as in a point cloud model and switching the display to render the VR avatar from the VR avatar window to a light field display. Because uh, because of emphasizing the presence of the VR avatar in the rear. The VR player can also control a few objects installed in the demo booth. Concretely, Hiyose can control the LED and the sub motor with his or her input. And VR player can also check it through the point cloud model. Next, please. Yes. Uh, finally, I summarize our research project. We propose the next version of Mobius Life, a novel augmented virtuality system which is collaborative with the LIA. Compared to our last research, we draw uh, bidirectional interactions and VR avatar's presence in the real world by modifying our methods, virtual window, and teleport to the real, for improving our maturity of interactions. Uh, we provide another interaction touching uh, with each other to virtual window, besides throwing an object into VR. Furthermore, we also attempt to strengthen the presence of the uh, VR avatar in the real world by developing the system to show a light field image of the VR avatar with looking glass and synchronize the VR player's posture to it via web socket. Rendering the point cloud 3 model of the audience area uses the VR and the real world visually. Plus, from the VR side, player can control a part of physical objects in the real world, which enriches the experience for the VR side. After that, we developed a demonstration game containing three stages. Our previous research did not fully represent our concept because there's no obvious task or goal. Instead, in this research, we clarify our research concept. Now, VR player and audiences play the same content together by preparing a collaborative VR game with our new VR methods. Next, please. Yes, I have just a little problem. I need to reconnect the screen. Uh, reconnect? Ah. So... <laughs> yes, <Okay. laughs> it's deconnecting. So my screen is freezing, so sorry. I uh, just I have a few minutes, seconds, uh, in order to reconnect it. Okay, this one. Ah, okay, okay. Ah, sorry. Uh, ah, this... Ah. Uh, yeah, this okay. uh, slide is right. Okay. So, do you want to do it? Uh, I, I uh, proceed my presentation. Sorry. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, but now, uh, our proposal method still have some problems. Uh, first of all, a bidirectional interaction system is not completely symmetric, especially interaction from the rear side in virtual window and that from the rear side in teleport to the rear are weak. We tried some features for bidirectional interaction in our previous research, but omitted them because those are difficult to be understood. So we need to seek more interaction ways which both the VR player and audience can interact easily and mutually. Another one is the VR system and the light field display and are not completely separated because an RGBD camera is embedded in not in the light field display, but the VR system. 
we think flexibility of mutual interaction will increase much more if we can implement the uh, wireless sending system for an RGB camera with using the real-time communication API like WebRTC. In addition, we have not verified the impact or efficiency of our proposed interactions yet. We believe experiments to verify our methods in a practical situation will be helpful for providing uh, uh, develop, uh, uh, for developing the uh, VR application being collaborative with the real, because such kind of applications are already launched and will be increasing. Uh, that's all of my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the technical trouble, but ah, no problem. Me too, so. I have too many, too many uh, windows on my computer, and some I have some question on uh, private chat that I need to answer, and um, something uh, something break. Uh, but we finish the presentation, and so sorry about this. So thank you for this presentation. Uh, we just have time for two questions I exchange uh, with the room. Have you some comments or questions? Yes, no no questions? Yes, there is a, a rising hand. I, I don't have seen who, but I think uh, I see a hand. Okay. Someone raising a hand. I uh, don't have seen who, but I, I think it's Robin. No, Ken. 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 Yes. How do you get it? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I very appreciate your. Okay. Ah uh, yes. Ah. Uh, oh, I just closed the mic. Now, uh, my question is, uh, is there some time delay in the transmission of motion between VR and real? And do you uh, think such delay affects the interaction? Are you, uh, sorry, uh, you mean, yes. uh, uh, you ask me the, uh, how to uh, uh, send, uh, what kind of information uh, uh, or technology you use uh, to transmit in a gesture or... Uh, no, uh, or is there a time delay in your system? Ah, uh, time. Uh, 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 we don't. We didn't feel no. Uh, 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 any time delay uh, because uh, we uh, uh, implemented and uh, tried it uh, in. Uh, uh, what is it? What is it? What is it? It is in a uh, uh, local uh, network and, uh, and using a web socket uh, for uh, technology. So. Uh, uh, maybe I think uh, it it uh, causes a uh, delay or any uh, uh, it uh, 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 it's hardly cause a uh, technical or network problem or any delay. So uh, so uh, because uh, we only uh, tried it uh, in a, a local area network uh, using the uh, uh, ESA net network cable. So I uh, so if uh, I uh, need to uh, use and apply to the more practical 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 situation or a uh, product production. So I need to uh, uh, I need to test uh, I need to verify the uh, uh, more uh, practical and uh, implementation networks. Uh, we uh, I need to test it. Uh, that uh, is that the uh, is that like the okay. Thank uh, you. What uh, you want to ask? It? Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have a question. Yes. Kate. Yes. Uh, okay. I guess so. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation, Koki. So, oh, thank you. Oh. So now you using the uh, okay? Can you? Ah, okay, okay. Now uh, uh, you okay. using the characters in this time. Character. Uh, okay. Ah. Yes. You using okay. the characters in this. this uh, no, character. 
Yeah, for Kepta. example, so animation or uh, any other manga character in this one. But uh, have you considered the training to the modern the real person? Uh, modern, uh, sorry, real, real person? Real. real. Have you considered trying to model the real person? Real uh, person. Real person. Uh, 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 yeah, so, so I mm, didn't. Uh, uh, no, I didn't stop, uh, think, so uh, I didn't think it because uh, no, uh, because uh, in the uh, in uh, that research, so I uh, want to uh, express the virtual world, the real world, uh, and uh, the real world uh, is. Uh, uh, yeah. Some kind of a different world or another world uh, next to the uh, real world. So uh, uh, we want to uh, uh, express the uh, real world and the real world is uh, uh, make, uh, in, uh, exist coexist uh, exist in yeah, parallel. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we uh, want to make the real world uh, uh, makes the uh, different from the. The real world. So we uh, 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 showing the character in the application is, uh, I think, the uh, better way to uh, express so, uh, uh, and matches for uh, our expression. What matches?